Hi everyone and welcome to this video on interference of light, Young's double slit experiment. It's Mr. Hamilton. We know so far that light is a particle and a wave, but we haven't explored why that's the case. We also know that in the late 1600s there was a debate that started between Newton, who was in the particle camp, and Huygens, who was in the wave camp, about is light a wave or is it a particle? And so what Young did in the early 1800s, after over 100 years of debate about this, is he was out to show that light is a wave. And up to that point, scientists were looking for evidence of light interference from two sources, but they never found it. The reason they never found it, it there's actually two reasons. The first reason is that the two light sources had to be close together. The two light sources had to be close together. Now, when we're talking about close together, we're talking about very close together. We're talking about millimeters apart, if not even closer. The second reason was that the two light sources were not in phase. The two, my pen will work for me. Two light sources were not in phase. What they mean by that is that the photons, we now know they're photons, at the time they didn't know that, the photons need to be released at the exact same time. So that's the basis of what was done by Young. He was able to finally get the light sources close enough together and then release those light sources at the exact same time. And so this took over 100 years from when the debate began for Thomas Young to actually find this evidence. He used one source, so the light was in phase. But what he did is instead of having to shine two lights, he was able to go ahead and put two slits, very closely spaced slits. A very clear interference pattern was seen, and this was strong evidence for light being waves much like water waves from point sources. I'll reference a video in the comments below this that you should be watching to see what this actually looked like. If I was in class with you, I'd actually show you this in front of you, uh, but I can't, unfortunately. Notice the following diagram of two water waves interfering after passing through two slits. So let's look at this diagram here on the right. You can see there that there's some water waves coming from this slit, some water waves coming from this slit. And what happens is right in here, you get this, this um, superposition of the waves, this constructive interference. And so you get these really big peaks followed by these really small troughs right behind it. And that's what you get everywhere along this line right here and everywhere along this line right here. And you can see that pattern as it goes out like that. And then what you get in these other parts in between those, which I'll draw in a different color here, you get um, the, instead of constructive interference, you get this destructive interference that's happening along there. Just like you see if you see, um, if you've ever been out in a boat and you see the waves of two boats meeting, you'll get a really big wave that splashes really big. And then you'll get some areas where the waves don't form at all. And so you get this constructive interference and destructive interference. It's a superposition of waves. And so what you get from water waves is you get these really big waves hitting right at the bright spots there. And these barely any waves or none at all hitting at these dark spots. And that's analogous to what we actually see with light, because light forms this interference pattern when it's shown between two slits that are close together and the, where those light waves are in phase. In the middle, just as I noted, let's fill these blanks in here, constructive interference occurs. That causes a maximum amplitude, so we get a very high peak, a very low trough. This is represented by the light colors on the screen at the top. On each side of the middle, right next to it, right here and right here, what we get is destructive interference. That causes the waves to cancel out and we get zero amplitude overall and so we see this by the dark areas. The same was true for light as I already indicated. Well, why do we get interference? Well, the reason we get interference is because of the principle of superposition, as I already alluded to. And so here's just another picture where you see this. This is now, instead of water waves, it's, it's like a laser light. And this is representing 
uh, peaks and troughs of, of laser light. And what you can see is right here, you get this constructive interference. Right here, we get constructive interference. Right here, we get constructive interference. And so the constructive interference is happening everywhere right along here, but in between in these places, we get that destructive interference. And so that's what's happening in light. And so hence you get this bright patch there, bright patch, bright patch right there. That's a little off. Bright patch, that should be referring to that down there, and this should be referring to the bright patch down there. And then these dark patches in between are the destructive interference. So that's what's happening with light. So at this point, it would be a really good idea just to pause the video and check out that, uh, that video that I referenced below if you haven't already. And then you can come back and finish this off as we get into more of the calculations. You'll note in that video that the technology is very old. So bear with it. It's, uh, it's amazing how fast technology changes. But I think it's still very relevant to teaching you about Young's double slit experiment. I hope you found that helpful. Let's look at some of the calculations and how these are actually derived. Consider two beams of photons that meet at the same point on the screen as shown. So here's our screen. This is the all the way from here, all the way down to the bottom. That's our screen. And then you can see that we have these two slits. Now, obviously, this is exaggerated. Really, uh, to really see this effect well, the distance between the slits is about one millionth the distance from the slits all the way to the wall or the screen. So it's important that we recognize this is not to scale. So if we shine a light, here's our, our light source over here. We turn a light bulb on or something. And as we turn that light bulb on, that shines light at these slits. Now what happens is we have these slits close enough together is we see this interference pattern. We, as we said, we get bright, then dark, then bright on both sides of the, of the middle. Now notice a couple of things here. Um, because the slits are very close together, the angles are essentially the same, right? This angle here and it's essentially the same as this angle. And then this angle is just we're making a, a right angle triangle here. Um, and that's representing there. Because it's such a big dis distance compared to the D value, that is, a, is basically the same. Um, so if we take this triangle right here, that triangle right there, let's call this side E just for simplicity's sake. So you see where this D sine theta comes from. Um, and we go ahead and we write sine theta. Well, sine theta is equal to the opposite side, of which is E divided by the adjacent side, or the hypotenuse, I'm sorry, which is D. And if we then cross multiply, we get D sine theta. And so we get this extra distance that this wave travels to be that distance D sine theta. And so we can write that in as the past path difference. So this is going to be a bright point if it has in fact traveled an entire other wave. So these, let's say they're all traveling like this all the way continued all the way to the to the wall and then this one's going to travel same way but it's going to be the length of this piece and this piece down to here are the same but then it's going to travel an extra wavelength in its traveling and so because of that it's still going to be in phase and it's going to meet in phase giving us a bright point on the screen for bright fringes, the path difference will be an integer multiple of the wavelength. In this case, it's one more times the wavelength. We could also have a bright spot that would be two more times the wavelength if I got two waves in there, or three times the wavelength if I get three waves in there. Uh, alternatively, if I was shining it straight at the screen, they would travel the same distance, and then there would be no difference in wavelength, but they'd still be in phase, so that's why you get a bright spot right in the middle. So according to this uh, equation for bright fringes, and it's important to keep this in mind, this is bright fringes, n, which is the number of integer multiples of the wavelength times the wavelength, is equal to d, which is the distance between the slits times sine theta. n is the integer number of full wavelengths theta is the wavelength of the light in meters. Now keep in mind light is often in nanometers. So you're going to have to change it to meters times 10 to the negative 9. And D is the distance between the slits. And again, this will often be in millimeters or even smaller. So you need to go ahead and convert that to meters. Always in SI units for these types of calculations. But theta is often too small to measure. So then what do we do? Well, let's look at dark fringes and come back to this question. For dark fringes, the destructive interference is going to occur. So in other words, 
uh, a half of a wavelength would have to occur. Instead of a whole wavelength happening in here, where I've got that, a half a wavelength would have to occur. So a wavelength like this would occur. If half a wavelength occurred, we'd have an exactly out of phase wave with the other one, and we would get destructive interference. And so if we just take that n value, we subtract a half, or we add a half to it, we end up getting the destructive interference equation. So this is what we get. But again, keep in mind that theta is too small. It's usually much less than 1. So how do we actually approximate this if it's much less than 1? Well, consider with me for a minute this idea. I have a right angle triangle. And I'm going to label these sides A, B, and C. Now, if this angle is really, really small, if theta is really, really small, much less than 1, it's often going to be the case here, what we get when we take tan alpha, or this is, in general, we get this. We get A over B, and then sine theta, in general, would be A over C. But if that theta is really, really small, you'll notice here that the A's are the same, but B approaches C, right? And so if B approaches C, then really this and this are equal, and these ratios are basically the same. And this is an approximation that actually works in terms of us being able to calculate and see this and actually test it. It's a good enough approximation that we can use. That tan theta being approximately equal to sine theta is going to be really useful here because as we look at this triangle here, from the slits out to a bright spot out here, um, that distance out to that bright spot from the center of that middle bright spot is going to be labeled as yn. And then the distance from the slits to the screen is going to be labeled as L. If we take tan of this angle, tan is opposite over adjacent, we get tan is yn over L, the distance from the center bright spot divided by the length from the slits to the screen. Now we also had the idea here that n times lambda was equal to d sine theta. And because n lambda was d sine theta, but sine theta is approximately equal to tan theta, we can replace the sine with the tan. And then we can look at this and say, well, I know tan theta is yn over L. So we've gotten rid of the tans and the angles altogether, and we don't even have to consider the angles anymore because the angle is so small. This gives, and it's important to note this for this equation, the distance from the middle of the second of the central bright spot to the center of another bright spot. All right, so it's middle of a center bright spot to the center of another bright spot. If we set n equals 1, then it's the distance from the middle of the center fringe to the middle of the first fringe away, which is going to be the same distance as the distance from the first fringe to the second fringe, etc. Practically speaking, if we have light forming in the middle here, here's the center fringe, then that means the distance from on both sides here, we're going to have all these interference patterns forming like this. That means the distance from here to here is equal to the distance from here to here, which is equal to the distance from here to here. And we can go out as far as we can. It's eventually going to get fainter and fainter, but we are going to see interference pattern depending on how dark screen we have and how bright of a light source we have. And so these fringes are going to get less and less bright the further out we go, but we should be able to see a number of them. And the distance between the center of each bright fringe to the next center of each bright fringe is given by this delta y. Now hopefully that doesn't throw you off. I've used the black to represent a bright fringe, um, and then the, the dark parts in between are white. So hopefully that, that doesn't throw you off too much. But it's worth noting here as well that the distance between the dark fringes, so from the center of this dark fringe to the center of this dark fringe, is going to be equal to the distance between the bright fringes. These are all equal distances. And so because of that, we can use this equation, whether we're given information about the dark fringes or about the bright fringes, and we can solve it from there. So I hope that's helpful. We're going to do an example in the next video that's short and walks you through how to do this for the double slit experiment. Really cool stuff uh, that really helped us in our understanding of what light actually was. This is a huge breakthrough through his time for his time. And Thomas Young put a lot of thought, a lot of energy, and a lot of work into making this. We owe him a debt of gratitude.